And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Is the story of what happened starting in 1619 and has continued for the last four hundred years in America, four hundred years in America, four hundred years in America. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with their great substance. Of the enormous contributions, sacrifices, have been made by African Americans. Let me put it this way, that from a very literal point of view, the harbors and the ports and the railroads of the country, the economy especially of the southern states could not conceivably be what it has become if they had not had and do not still have indeed and for so long so many generations cheap labor i am stating very seriously and this is not an overstatement I picked the cotton, and I carried it to market, and I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing, for nothing. The southern oligarchy, <coughs> which has until today so much power in Washington, and therefore some power in the world, was created by my labor and my sweat and the violation of my women and the murder of my children. This, in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And no one can challenge that statement. It is a matter of historical record. Newark, New Jersey became a city of race riots, violence, looting, and hate. For five days, it was a battleground and a looter's paradise. Colored citizens clashed with police, national guardsmen, and state troopers. 24 people were killed and 1,200 injured. Nearly half the city was in the grip of terror. The Newark flare-up sparked similar riots in other American centers, with hatred near danger point between white and black extremist groups. In Newark, there was an uneasy tension, punctuated by minor outbreaks of violence after five days of bloody fighting. From rooftops and windows, snipers pick their targets. The toll of dead and injured tells its own tragic story. Damage runs into millions of dollars. With the coming of the long, hot summers, for three years America has had to face the tragic consequences of riots stemming from the slums of cities stretching right across the nation. Negroes claim they have waited long enough for equal rights. Militant leaders of some urge violence as the answer. This was one example. They've been raised to believe, and by now they helplessly believe, that no matter how terrible their lives may be, and their lives have been quite terrible, and no matter how far they fall, no matter what disaster overtakes them, they have one enormous knowledge and consolation, which is like a heavenly revelation. At least they are not black. <laughs> now I suggest that of all the terrible things that can happen to a human being, that is one of the worst. It was called the Red Summer of 1919, named for the blood that ran through America's cities during months of racial unrest. African-American soldiers had returned home from the Great War, World War I, to a country still teeming with discrimination. And in their quest for civil rights, tensions between blacks and whites reached a tipping point. 
Deadly race riots broke out in over two dozen cities, but one rural town, Elaine, Arkansas, would become the epicenter for the bloodshed. The violence there, lynch mobs, torture, indiscriminate murder, was so horrific it would go down in history not as a race riot, but as the Elaine Massacre. This is history. Dark history. In a system called sharecropping, farmers provided landowners with labor for a share of crops produced. But the system was rigged. Sharecroppers were often kept in perpetual debt. One black sharecropper raised $500 worth of cotton and his landlord told him, yeah, but you used $697 worth of supplies, so you owe me money. For roughly 50 years, the system went unchecked. In the fall of 1918, a black man from Arkansas had had enough. Robert Hill had decided to form a union to represent sharecroppers. It was a dangerous decision and one that would set off a chain of events involving mass murder, torture, and a landmark Supreme Court ruling. But first, he would need to organize. In his message, Hill was pretty simple and direct. Why is it that we cannot have fair payment for the honest and hard work we do? Despite the inherent risk involved with challenging whites. And while they're having this discussion, a car rolls up the road. Two white men were in the car. By one account, one of the white men in the car said, you all get away from there. And shortly thereafter, a shot was fired. Though it remains unclear who fired first, a barrage of gunfire broke out. One of the white men was killed almost instantly. The rumor of a black uprising spread in a matter of hours. The idea of a sharecropper rebellion conveniently played into the hands of landowners who did not want their sharecropping practices scrutinized. They did all they could, as quickly as they could, to sound alarms that black farmers were out for white blood. Posses of white men were sent to find, detain, and kill the offenders. You see houses being attacked, black-owned homes being ransacked. The black school was burnt. Notable families were killed. Black women and children have to go literally hide out in the woods because many of these people are indiscriminately shooting at African-American women and their children. Shooting at African-American women and their children. Shooting at African-American women and their children. Isn't 400 years enough? 400 years, at least three wars? The American soil is full of the corpses of my ancestors. Why is my freedom or my citizenship or my right to live there, how is it conceivably a question now? Greenwood was populated exclusively by African Americans, many of whom were very prosperous and ran successful businesses. Because of Jim Crow laws, Greenwood's residents weren't able to shop at white-owned businesses in Tulsa. A hundred years ago, Greenwood had its own hospital, many doctors, including a nationally renowned surgeon, a library, schools, hotels, theaters, and a whole lot more. What followed was mayhem. White Tulsans who didn't have guns stole guns and ammunition from gun shops or hardware stores, and they headed for Greenwood. Greenwood, a symbol of black progress, was burned to the ground completely. More than 20 black churches, a hospital, a funeral home, a school, a theater, doctors and lawyers offices, hotels, grocery stores, restaurants, and hundreds and hundreds of homes, more than a thousand structures were all completely destroyed. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with their great substance. Now when our game starts running, and after all, after all, baby, we have survived the roughest game in the history of the world. Yeah. You know, we really have. No, no, no matter what we say against ourselves, you know, no matter what our limits and hang-ups are, <laughs> you know, we have come through some, we have come through something, you know. Between 1882 and 1968, there were almost 5,000 known lynchings spread across more than 40 states. Experts agree that there were undoubtedly more, maybe thousands more. Almost three quarters of the people who were lynched were African American. Think about what's involved in this. Lynching was murder carried out by a mob. 
and often with the cooperation of law enforcement. If law enforcement didn't actively participate, and there were times the law couldn't prevent a mob from doing what it wanted to do, law enforcement officers often refused to try to prevent the murder and were complicit in what went on. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And the love that you have for each other is being to be destroyed hour by hour and day by day. It's not her fault. It's not your fault. But there it goes because the pressures under which you live are inhuman. The pressures under which you live are inhuman. The pressures under which you live are inhuman. 